Support comes from Gather Pottery, a clay studio in Seattle's Interbay neighborhood offering memberships and classes, hosting Petals and Pottery, a flower arranging class using ceramic vessels created by Gather Potters, on April 28th. More at gatherpottery.com. Support comes from the San Juan Islands. Spring in the San Juans can provide time to slow down and savor the scenery of quiet beaches, hiking, biking, and whale watching on Lopez, Orcas, and San Juan Island and Friday Harbor. Learn more at visitsanjuans.com. Set your mind to island time. You're ready? Yeah. Okay. Today, the fairy predicament. On the Black Ball Ferry Line, up in Seattle, where the sun shines, seldom shines, up in Seattle, all the whistles go, and the bells go, and the ferry boats are chugging right along, right along. But the boats are breaking down right and left, and replacements won't come for four more years at best. That's prompted questions about how we get around, because it's expensive to haul cars across the sea. Ferries are iconic in Washington state, but they're also breaking down. It's one disruption after another. Crew shortages, boats out of service. The Edmonds Kingston Crossing is now down to one boat. Some folks were stranded there overnight. You're listening to Booming. I'm Monica Nicholsberg. And I'm Joshua McNichols. What if we're thinking about ferries all wrong? Yeah, waterfront communities are asking that same question, and they're finding a solution for the future buried in the past. Today's ferries were built to move cars, but this new approach could help us kick our car habit and fight climate change. I went to Bremerton. It's just a short ferry ride away from Seattle to preview what that future could look like. Ferry boats are chugging, chugging along. That's coming up. But first, Monica, what are you working on? I'm working on something a little bit different. (laughs) I have been out in the field reporting on what's being called the Stripper's Bill of Rights. Okay, that is different. I went to a club a few days ago to meet with these dancers and activists, and they told me that Washington is one of the worst places in the country to strip. And this bill that they're advocating for, they say, would make things better. What makes Washington such a bad place for them to work? So two things. One, there were a bunch of regulations that were passed decades ago that criminalized different aspects of stripping, like everything from being tipped while you're on stage to where you put your clothes back on. And they say that that makes them afraid to report abuse because they know that they're breaking rules the second they get on stage. Yeah, we talk about being a kind of progressive city, but, you know, this sounds kind of backwards. Yeah, it's a a more conservative approach than I think a lot of people living in the Seattle area would expect. Along those lines, the other thing that makes it really tough for them is alcohol service is illegal anywhere that there's nudity. So clubs can really only make money by charging dancers a bunch of fees. They have to pay what's called rent, just kind of the cost of dancing there. And they say it's higher than other states because without alcohol sales, the clubs don't really have any other way to make money. They told me that sometimes those fees can be more than they even make in a shift, and they can build up these debts to the clubs for back rent. It almost sounds like they could end up in some kind of indentured servitude to the company they work for. Yeah, and they're also responsible for tipping out security guards, waitresses. I mean, they're really the only money-making option for these clubs. And Madison Zach Wu, the campaign manager for this group called Strippers Are Workers, says that puts them in unsafe situations. Without any food or drink or entertainment to sell, we are the commodity. I experienced multiple instances of it being slow and management encouraging me to work with customers that were known to be harmful and violent even. And there was definitely a pressure to to dance with them. And it all just comes back to this pressure for clubs to make money off of you. So what would the Strippers Bill of Rights do? So clubs wouldn't be able to charge dancers more than they make in a shift. It would cap the fees that they charge them at 30 percent. There would also be some safety measures put in place, like making sure there's a security guard on duty, putting keypads on locker rooms. And it would create a path for strip clubs to get alcohol licenses, although it's not guaranteed that that license will be created. So what's the status of the bill? The bill's moving through the state legislature, so I'm going to continue to cover it. All right. Okay, coming up next, the problems and the promise of ferry boats. 
That's after the break. Support comes from the Discovery Inn on Washington's San Juan Island, an island getaway that's a ferry ride away, now taking reservations for summer and fall. More information and booking available at discoveryinn.com. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Hey, it's me. I'm on the ferry. I I just wanted to say that, um, God, I wish you could see this. Weather's classic Seattle. Uh, Water is so blue. Oh, Derek. (laughs) Derek of Grey's Anatomy and his ferry rides, right? I'm going to do this a lot more when I get home, by the way. You, me, and the family. We're just going to take a day and ride the ferry boat all day if we want. He's just, he's yeah. so much. He's, <laughs> he's a drama queen. So these ferries, they're, they're iconic, right? We all think of them when we think of Washington State. They show up in every film, every show that's set in Seattle. But behind the scenes, about a third of the fleet is broken, and many of the crew members retired during COVID. So boats are late, boats are breaking down, and it seems like every day we hear new stories of problems. Washington State Ferries hasn't been able to return to normal status since the pandemic. To help after a Washington State ferry ran aground. It is going to be a long wait for some ferry passengers tonight after one boat broke down between Seattle and Bainbridge Island. What does this actually look like on the ground? Well, I went out and I asked ferry riders and they told me it's disruptive. Today I was trying to catch a ferry at Bainbridge and two boats were, of course, canceled again. It's not dependable. If you got to be somewhere, I wouldn't take the ferry because it's not dependable. I have family and friends that still live over in Seattle. Uh, they just don't even think of the Bremerton boat as an option anymore because it's not reliable enough. And so the commercial activity comes to a halt. Quite a few businesses in Friday Harbor have folded up. The ferries are like highways that connect relatively isolated communities to the mainland. People cross the water for jobs, for school, for doctor's visits, for cheaper housing, for cultural events. Yeah, I love going out to the peninsula, but lately I've been thinking twice about it because it's just such a nightmare getting there. Yeah, and it's disruptions that have also prevented, you know, tourists from going over in that direction and spending money there, right? So businesses are suffering. Amy Camp runs the West Side Film Festival in Bremerton. I've had filmmakers show up late to their showing devastated because the ferry didn't run at the right time. And I hate the fact they're being denied a chance to interact with other filmmakers and maybe make connections that lead to bigger and better films because of the ferry schedule. So she told me she ends up giving out lots of comp tickets and free merchandise to try to make festival attendees happy, you know, when they when they come late for a showing and they miss their movie. You know what this reminds me of? There right. was this really cool music festival in Port Townsend called Thing. And they thing. only thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went to it and it was awesome. But they only had one event. And then they recently announced that they're going to be looking for another venue because they couldn't get enough people out there. They couldn't get enough people to cross the water because of the ferry shortage. Well, they didn't cite the ferries, but I mean, I think the writing's on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I heard all kinds of examples of how people are being impacted in, from the ferry slowdown. There's, there's cancer patients who can't get to their chemotherapy appointments in Friday Harbor. And then when the inner island ferry breaks down in the San Juans, sometimes high schoolers who live on Shaw Island can't get home from school. Yikes. So if the ferry system is so important to all of us, how did it become such a mess? Well, it was laid out pretty clearly by Kitsap Representative Greg Nance, He says it's a combination of chronic underfunding, uh, a silver tsunami. That means, you know, a lot of older ferry workers retired during COVID and deferred maintenance. Also, outdated technology. I mean, these ferry boats are diesel and it costs almost half a million dollars to fill the tank of the Wenatchee, which is one of the biggest ferries. 
there, there's new hybrid electric boats coming, but high costs and other factors have delayed them until at least 2028. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the idea of a half a million dollar tank of gas. <laughs> right, right. You think it's hard for you to fill a, a car in, in today's economy, you know? <laughs> yeah. So how are the communities that rely on these ferries getting around this problem? Well, they're turning to smaller boats. In King County and Kitsap County, for example, they've got this fleet of cheaper, faster foot ferries. It's kind of like public transit. They're much smaller boats that carry only people. They don't carry cars, and they're faster. They cross the Puget Sound in just half the time as the big ferries, and they don't take nearly as much fuel. And then, you know, in the San Juan Islands, you've got there, they want to kind of deputize a fleet of, of private boats that are kind of like, you know, water taxis that can take cancer patients to their chemo appointments and take kids home from school when they get stranded, stuff like that. And all these communities are turning to the state to help fund and expand these fleets. I mean, th this is kind of the first steps in a reimagining of what kind of ferries we want more of in the future. OK, I'm just still trying to, like, think about what a different fairy could be, because in my mind, a fairy is a static thing. It is the thing in Grey's Anatomy that <laughs> Derek is obsessed with, you know, big, green and white. It carries cars like that's what a fairy is. It's hard for me to even imagine what a different kind of fairy would look like. I know. But I mean, there's a lot of things in life that we think about as sort of unchanging. You know, the freeways as they are, we think of as unchanging. But fairies didn't always used to be this way. It didn't used to always be the way we got around, you know, in the past Ferries actually used to be this sort of smaller, nimbler fleet. They called it a mosquito fleet. You know, these little boats kind of buzzing around wherever they want to go, right? OK, I'm trying to picture a mosquito fleet. So like tiny boats that can only carry a couple of people? Exactly. You know, ferries are big. Then they, they can hardly change their course once they've started. But these mosquito fleets, they can land on beaches. They can land on private docks. They can land all over the place. I mean, in, in, think about the iconic ferries of Washington State. They're big. The largest ferries can carry over 200 cars and 2,500 people. And it, that's the size of like a small liberal arts college, right? That's a lot of people. And, and they mostly serve to connect big cities like Seattle and Anacortes with smaller communities across the Sound. But 100 years ago, the waterfront communities of Puget Sound were sort of linked by this network of mosquito-sized boats. And communities grew up around the Mosquito Fleet ferry docks. I learned about that from Mary Phelps at the Kitsap Historical Museum in Bremerton. That really started creating the personality of Kitsap County, where towns were cropping up on these boat harbors. And we didn't have roads for a very long time. We didn't have roads really until even like the 40s, 50s area that's really connecting the interstates um, between all of these towns. After World War II, the ferries had become strategically important. You know, thousands of workers commuted on the ferries each day from their homes in Seattle to the shipyard in Bremerton. By this time, the Mosquito Fleet had been all bought up by a single owner, and the fleet was known as the Black Ball Line. You know, you may have heard that mentioned in that song we played in the billboard at the top. Yeah, it's still stuck in my head. <laughs> Get aboard, get aboard when the weather's fine. Take your pick of the ferries on the Black Ball Line. The, the owner of the Black Ball Line threatened to raise fares by 30 percent. This was in the high inflation period after World War II. And the public reacted angrily. The backlash eventually led to Washington State buying the ferries. And the ferry boats are chugging right along. That sounds kind of familiar. Seattle revolting against a big monopoly and uh, moving to have the government nationalize it. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's kind of what happens over time as services evolve from, you know, nice to have things into something we feel that we have a right to. The ferries became part of the state highway department in Washington, and they were supposed to be a temporary solution until bridges could be built across Puget Sound. But the bridges were never funded. That is wild to me. I can't imagine the Puget Sound with bridges across it. Like, it reminds me of San Francisco or New York where, you know, you look out across the water and you see a bunch of bridges. It would be a totally different place. Yeah, imagine whale watching from the side of one of those bridges. Well, that does actually sound pretty cool. <laughs> OK, so back to what's happening right now. There's not enough ferries. They're really old. So people are experimenting. 
Tell me about what you learned in Bremerton about how they're handling this. Yeah. So, you know, there's this sort of forced pause because Bremerton's down from two car ferries to one. So it's sort of cut their commerce in half. More people are now walking onto the boats instead of driving. And then the foot ferries have become much more popular than they used to be because they're a kind of faster, more reliable alternative now. And community leaders are starting to see the benefits of these faster foot ferries more clearly. Here's Bremerton's mayor, Greg Wheeler. The thing about with fast ferries is that's a more economical way of doing marine transit by far. The engines are... They're less complex, they're smaller, it's smaller, more efficient use of space. Because they don't have to carry all those cars, right? Yeah, it makes sense. But beyond that, Mayor Wheeler says foot ferries can help him revive Bremerton's downtown. Wait, okay, so the foot ferries I get is sort of this like slapdash solution because the ferry system is such a mess, but he's saying that they could also solve this other problem of struggling downtowns. Can you connect the dots for me? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's actually not that complicated. The idea is that if you're not driving a car onto a ferry, if you're taking your feet, if you're walking on with your feet, when the ferry dumps you out, you're not going to go that far. You're going to stay downtown and maybe spend money downtown. You're not going to walk all the way out to the Silverdale Mall down the highway. Okay, yeah, it's like creating forced pedestrian traffic. Exactly. And and this is something that the city has embraced. Andrea Spencer is the head planner for the city of Bremerton. I absolutely believe in, in the passenger-only ferries and, and getting people to them. They can't take their cars there, so how do we get them to the walk-on passengers? We have them leave their cars at home, and they just walk there. So Bremerton's spending a lot of money on this idea. They're actually trying to build a sort of spine of walkability all the way through downtown to a park at the other side where there's going to be a whole bunch of housing. So they're sort of building this idea around passenger ferries. Interesting. Is it actually working? Well, I talked to some ferry riders about how they're using this system. Like, for example, when I took the foot ferry over, I talked to a teacher, Alex Pacifico, and she's a middle school teacher in Bremerton. She lives in Seattle, and she takes the foot ferry over every weekday morning. You don't need a car over there? I don't. No, I have a lot. I do a lot of biking, and then my friends kind of pick me up in Bremerton. You know, it's kind of like all centralized downtown, so it makes it kind of easy to get around. And then the ferry terminal is just right there. So, Do you you feel like Bremerton's a pretty walkable city? Downtown Bremerton, yes. Um... Other than that, you know, once you get out of downtown, not so much. But I think downtown Bremerton, like Manette area, pretty walkable. The big shift here is that people today are starting to think of these foot ferries as more like public transit, right? And less like a part of the Washington State highway system. They're they're more about moving pedestrians to places where they'll, you know, support local businesses and downtowns than it is about, you know, getting people sort of through these downtowns and out into the suburbs. And, you know, the mayor of Bremerton is hoping that someday a new mosquito fleet of ferries could help revive all the old towns that grew up around ferry docks in Puget Sound. Yeah, I mean, walkable cities are great. That is definitely something that we need. But a lot of the communities that rely on the ferries are spread out and they need cars to get around. Did you talk to anybody who relies on their cars and see what they think about this plan? Yeah, there were a lot of people I spoke to in Bremerton who are sort of used to the suburban lifestyle and aren't really looking to change. To me personally, the freedom to be able to drive is is paramount because I'm busy every day. Like today, for example, I have to go straight. I live in Seabeck, but I'm going south to Port Orchard uh, for a business meeting and So it seems like every day there's something. There's a honey-do list that you have to fulfill. That was Rick Fowler, and I talked to him as he was getting off work at the Bremerton shipyards. A lot of the San Juan Islands don't have tiny little towns by the ferry docks, and there are people who need to drive from their home on a rural part of the island onto the ferry to get to doctors and hospitals on the mainland. If their ferries don't show up, you know, they're in trouble. I imagine a lot of people feel this way. It's similar to when we talked about microhousing a couple episodes back, right? Like we have these values, these ideas about what our communities should be like. I think a lot of people have gotten behind the idea that we need to reduce our dependence on cars. But it's just not possible or practical for a lot of 
people living in suburban and rural communities for the way that we live right now. Yeah. And I think this actually raises this big sort of existential question for government today, which is basically like, we know that there is a system, a way we could organize society that is more efficient. But on the other hand, we've been building decentralized, car-centered communities for, you know, 60, 70, 100 years. And people have come to rely on those systems. And so now when we want to make this change, are we sort of abandoning the people who rely on that system, you know, and, and you end up with momentum for that old system? Yeah. So is there a way that we can bridge this divide between the sort of urbanist, dense vision for the future and the spread out car dependent reality that exists today? Well, I think those legacy systems are going to be there a long time until we start like buying people out and offering them, you know, financial incentives to move into cities and stuff. And nobody's talking about that yet. But in the long run, mayors and elected leaders are are starting to think about these systems, these more efficient urban systems, as where they're going to put growth in the future. So, you know, we can't erase that sort of old system on the landscape. And, you know, people wouldn't want to. People are attached to their, you know, woodland homes and whatever. But, um, you know, we are gradually moving towards a more efficient system. And I think leaders are sort of recognizing that and building towards it. And the ferries, which have been this symbol of the spread out Puget Sound region for so long, could be a tool in moving toward that future? Yeah, exactly. I mean, when elected leaders say we want our old ferries back, they're not also saying we want big ferries in addition. They're recognizing that the ferries of the future, when we actually start adding boats onto the fleet, are these smaller, more energy efficient, fuel efficient, you know, nimble mosquito fleet type operations. Well, maybe it's time for me to try one of these foot ferries. Yeah, in the foot ferry to Bremerton, there's a great fountain that's fun for little kids to play in in the summer. So you should take your kid there. Perfect. All right, coming up, the end game. At the end of each episode, we like to play a little game. This uh-huh. one is about fairies, icon of the Pacific Northwest. It's no surprise that they show up a lot in TV shows and movies. So I'm going to play a little bit of a little scene, and you have to guess where it comes from. Okay. The first one's kind of a giveaway. We've been talking about it all episode, but we couldn't leave it out. Need some help? Nothing more I can do here. How did this happen? It's a fog bank. Container ship put the ferry. We are totally geeking out on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> yes, this is Grey's Anatomy. This is a horrible scene. And this was my first introduction to ferry boats as a teenager growing up in Southern California, where there's like this crazy accident and hundreds of people are hurt because a ferry boat and a container ship crash into each other. And I have to say, that is not the scene. <laughs> like, now that I have moved here and traveled on many ferries, this does not feel plausible. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw that episode for the first time like uh, two months ago. It's very dramatic. Yeah, I, I, I love how they actually appear to have filmed it in Seattle, even though they used some kind of primitive CGI for like showing the damage to the ferry. Like you, you can see Seattle's waterfront there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next one is a little bit harder. This one I think I would get, but I don't know. It might have just been a moment when I was a kid. So let's see. Easy, boy. That's it. Hey, boy. I'm not going to hurt you. A horse on a ferry boat? Yeah, and uh, spoiler, it does not end well. Oh, no. Um, Well, I honestly, I don't know. Uh, Let's see. Could this be like some remake of The Black Stallion or something? No. Do you give up? I give up. This is The Ring, iconic horror film of my youth. It, like many spooky things, takes place in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, things just don't end well for this horse. (laughs) Oh, this is Ringu. Isn't that the Japanese name of the original Japanese version of this movie? Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, where they watch a videotape and then bad stuff happens to them. Yes, yes. It made the static of VHS players become suddenly this very terrifying thing. I didn't know there were fairies in that. Yep. All right, one more. Announcing the arrival of Ferry 41. Ferry 
Okay, so this cl- this is clearly like a climactic moment where somebody is waiting for their love interest to appear on a ferry boat, and they're waiting in the terminal. Am I right? You couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry to say. No. Um, okay, a hint. This one is kind of a trick question because it was technically filmed in Canada near Victoria, um, but it's supposed to take place in a fictionalized version of Port Townsend. Okay. Any ideas? No, I don't know what it is. This is Made, the Netflix miniseries, based on the book by Stephanie Land, who's from this area. It's about her experiences as a single mother getting out of an abusive relationship and cleaning houses. Oh, and once she took the ferry boat. Many times she took the ferry boat because she cleans houses out on the islands. And it's actually this really, really good show. I highly recommend it. It's like a very nuanced portrayal of poverty and the way that systems that are designed to help people actually end up burdening them more. What do you think it is about fairies that movie directors keep wanting to put in their films? It it, it, it seems like it says something about this place or about something. What is it? Well, they're this really important symbol, I think. And I think it has more to do with the decision to place things in the Puget Sound. You'll notice that there's a lot of like dark or creepy stuff here. It's kind of this cold, wet corner of the world. And so it's moody. And if you want to tell a moody story, it's a good place to do it. And if you want to say where you are, you got to use a ferry. Yeah, that's right. You know, the other thing about ferries is when you're out there in the middle of the Puget Sound, like you have a sense of smallness. You know what I mean? Even though the ferries are really big, it's like the sound is this giant flat body of water and you kind of feel small. That's very poetic. I think it's also kind of a plot device, right? It's taking our characters across the water to somewhere new. Yeah. I, you know, I, I know in some ways like the ferries function like that for people who cross the water every day. It's like it's, it's a way of sort of separating your private life from your work life. You know, you kind of make this transition every day. Those island people. That's it for booming. Big news. We finally have our booming email. Boom! (laughs) So if you have any questions or comments about the economy, what it's like to work and live in Seattle, artificial intelligence, our pets' names, really anything, email us at booming at KUOW.org. Yeah. And if you are enjoying our podcast, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. A special thanks to all our listeners out there who financially support KUOW. You make this show possible. If you want to help out, go to KUOW.org slash donate. And thanks again. Our producer is Lucy Suchek. Our editor is Carol Smith. I'm Joshua McNichols. And I'm Monica Nicholsberg. And we'll catch you next time.